All right. Good morning. Y'all doing well? All right. We've already had some church so far, huh? Uh, we got a great morning planned. Uh, I, I really believe, we, we've got a guest this morning named uh, Robert Upshaw. Uh, Robert is amazing. Um, I've gotten to know him this past week. We, we've been trying to, we played phone tag for like two or three weeks, and we finally got lunch this past week. And, you know, I, I just have a lot of respect for you, man. I'm going to say that to you, but in front of everybody else. Yeah, you know, I just met with you. I'm like, this guy's the real deal. Uh, he lives it, and I can tell, and his story is crazy. Y'all aren't even going to get to hear the whole thing. I'm going to have to have him come back so we can share more of his story. But, but I want to tell you all this, men, men of the community, this is a word for you. I'm telling you, if you listen 1% this morning, God is going to grow you. God is going to make you stronger. God is going to equip you, and, and, and you're, you're, you're going to help us go where God's called us to go. Amen? And so let's do this. Let's put a New Life Church downtown welcome together for Pastor Robert. Come on, y'all. Oh, well, it's a joy um, to be here this morning, to get the privilege and the right to speak to you guys. Um, I love God's Word. I, I love that, that, that we get to talk about Him and His greatness. Um, in all honesty, I have absolutely nothing to offer you this morning except Him. Because He is the only thing that will satisfy your soul. He's the only thing that will strengthen you, encourage you, challenge you, and mold you more into his image. Um, all I can do this morning is be a stumbling block, and I pray that I won't be that this morning. Um, I'm Pastor Robert. I've been on staff since January. Um, I'm married, Leslie Ann, right here in front of me, and we have seven kids, and um, they're busybodies. And our favorite person to talk about lately is our little grandson, little Kingston. Um, he, he will start preaching a little bit too, so just give him a hey man in a minute because he'll, he'll try to go right along with what I, I'm saying. But um, I, I, I get the right every, every week to go out into the schools um, and talk to young guys about manhood. Uh, it is such a need to try to direct young guys um, in a direction of God, in all honesty. I mean, we teach them about sports, we teach them about academics, we teach them, unfortunately, about sexual stuff in schools, but no one is teaching our guys how to be young men. Um, and there's a burden in my heart for young men. And I know that Pastor Fitz Hill here, he has a burden for young people um, because they're our future. God has called them to be leaders. That's why he created Adam first to lead. And today, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to try to tear you down, man. Just know that before we even get started, all right? Oh, man, what is he going to say about us? It's going to be encouraging, I promise you. It's going to be uplifting. But I, I just pray that you would hear what he, the Lord, is trying to say to you, what he's trying to convey to your heart, and what he's trying to motivate you to do and me to do for his kingdom. Amen? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, you are the awesome, mighty God. And it is so great to be in your presence this morning. Father, I just want you to do what you do. You just do what you do. Father, you know the hearts and the minds of every person who has walked into this building. You know what they're going through. You know what they're dealing with. You know what they're running from. You know what they're running to. Father, I just pray that you would speak to them. I pray that you would empower them to pursue you with a passion and a love because you're the one that has so much compassion to give back to us. Father, I pray that we'd realize that we are not meant to handle this life on our own. That's why you sent your only begotten son to die for us, so that we can lean on his strength and his power to get through whatever we have to get through. Father, I just pray that our ears would be open to hear. Father, you tell us it's one thing to hear the word, but it's so much important to do what the word says. And I pray this morning that we as men and whoever else it might hit, that we would do what the word says. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you for all that you're going to do here. We want to lift you up so that you would draw us all unto you, Lord. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to talk this morning about the characters of a godly dad. And we are in a time in our society where we desperately need godly dead. Now, I know that there's some in here who might not be a dad yet. I know at 18, I wanted to already be a dad. 
And one of the reasons for that is that my dad, which I didn't mention in the first service, but I'll mention it now, now that I have some courage, um, my dad and mom had 16 of us. Now, now, now stop it. I, 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 I know what you're thinking. Just, just stop it. Stop the nonsense running up in here. They love each other, all right? And they showed that love, okay? That's how we all got here, all right? Just, just leave it alone. Just leave it alone. But when I, when I, think, about, when I think about godliness, and, and I'll talk about this a little later on in, in the talk, and I, I think of, of my dad and the example that he was for us. And probably one of the best examples that he set for us is that he loved the Lord. He loved the Lord. And in loving the Lord and seeing how he interacted with us as kids, I wanted to be a dad. He made me want to be a dad because what he exhibited in our home, how he was there for us, and how his character lived up to wanting to be a godly dad. And I, I am so thankful for that. In, in God's word, you, you see it often when you read God's word about godly men and godly fathers in there. And some of them were good fathers. You have Noah, who was a righteous man according to what God's word says, and that he did not want his family to be corrupted. So he protected them and kept them from the madness. He built the ark and everything was great. And to that day, he needed something to drink. <laughs> and everything begins to fall apart. What about Abraham? Abraham was going to be the father of an entire nation, and he was. But Abraham got a little hasty, didn't he? He wanted his cake right then and there, so he had to have something before he got something down the road in what God had for him. Now, we ain't going to talk about all that. But what I am saying is that God had his hand on him, and if he would have just trusted God in his godliness, that it wouldn't have been 15 years later when he got the real promise in Isaac down the road. Moses, who was a godly man, and we know about Moses' life. Moses should have been dead long before he became Moses as we know him. But Moses was a righteous man, but Moses also was a man who thought that he stuttered too much and didn't want to go do what God told him to do. And I say this about these men is because one thing about everyone in God's word and all of us men and women, we're all filled with flaws. There are none of us here and I don't care how perfect you think your life is. I don't care how perfect you think your kids think you are. We're all flawed. And that's what we see in God's word. And that all happened because of the first human who had everything going for him decided that he would disobey God and brought the curse on to humanity. But the good thing about that is that God still has a plan for men to be godly, to be holy, to walk according to his word and live a life that pleases him. In Proverbs chapter 1, verse 8 through 9, it says, Listen, my son, this is Solomon, another man who loved God. God gave him wisdom. He had everything going for him, but he had a problem with women. He loved too many of them. And I'll, mm, that's a whole nother sermon. But he says here in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 8 and 9, he says, Listen, my son, to your father's instructions, and do not forsake your mother's teaching, they are a garland, garland to your grace, your head in a chain to adorn your neck. And when you think about that, he is telling his son, he has all of this wisdom that God has given him, and he is trying to direct his son in a, in a way that would bring honor to his father, earthly father, and to his heavenly father. But he doesn't leave just his instructions. He also says, Mama has a word too. Mama has taught you some things. So when you're out and about, you need to live up to these standards that we have for you, and then your life will be prolonged. And in all honesty, men and women, we're not doing that today. We are allowing our kids to do what they want to do oftentimes, and that's when we live with regret and shame and wonder, well, what did I do wrong? Oftentimes, it's not what you did wrong. It's what you didn't do right. And we find ourselves wondering why are our kids in a predicament that they might find themselves in. Rob Parson had this statement to us, and it reigns true in my life when I read this, and I hope it reigns in your life also to convict you. He says this, when your child is born, you have 6,570 days until he or she reaches the age of 18. 
If your child is 10 years old, you have 3,650 of those days have already gone. And then he closes with this. You have 2,920 left. Nothing will increase those numbers. When I start thinking about that, that when you bring this little fella, that little fella right there into the world, you have 6,000. 700, no, excuse me, 570 days to groom him or her to what you think God wants him to be. You see, our kids are not given to us just so that we can have a little football player, which was my dream, or a little baseball player, or a little scholar, or whatever. He or she is given to you, dads and moms, so that you would teach them how to be holy and godly, so that they would rise up one day and love God with all their heart, mind, and soul. That's why you have those little gifts that drive you crazy. That's why God has given them to you. He wants you to know how he feels in dealing with you. No, that's, that's not true. <laughs> that's not true. That's not true. But he gives us this gift and he says, this is what I have empowered you to have, this little person. And it is your job, Dad. It is your job, Mom. It is your job, Grandma, Grandpa, Uncle, Aunt, to empower this guy and instill godly things in him or her so they can be used one day for my glory. Now, I don't know if Job was thinking this way during his day. I don't know if he was keeping up with the days or with the weeks or with the months about his kids, but I do know this. He was a man who absolutely had a love relationship with the Father. He was a man who feared him and honored him and worshiped him and walked with him, and he sets one of the best examples about being a godly dad. Now, this is what I want you to hear this morning, dads. I don't want you to hear that you're doing a lousy job, all right? Because that's what society wants you to believe. Society, the TV shows that they put on, they have degraded dads, they belittle dads, they kick dads, they make dads out to be a joke. And really, part of the destruction in our society is because there are not enough dads doing what God has called them to do. And that's really the bottom line. When you see destruction out here, when you see kids buck wild, when you see kids engaging in all kinds of risky behavior, you can bet on it. Most of the time, dad is not involved. And what a shame and tragedy that is and has become in our society. Job was different. He was a man of integrity. He was a man who honored God. He was a man who worshiped God. And he wanted his kids to do the same. And so he taught them. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be up here on the screen. We're going to look at the first thing, first point here, <clears throat> is he is a blameless and upright man. In chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. And you know, we could stop right there, and I could preach on that for an hour and 15 minutes, but you'd leave. You say, Pastor Upshaw, we got to go. Time to eat. You talk too long, you talk too much, and we're going. But this is the deal. He talks here about him being blameless. And let me give you a little definition of blameless. It's spiritually and morally upright. It's people who cannot be accused of wrongdoing before people. It does not mean that he was sinless, okay? It does not mean that Job committed no sin. What it, did mean, what it does mean is that Job had a heart that beat for God. And that he morally was sound and spiritually he was sound and he was not going to violate like what God had taught him. And in doing that, God said, that's my man. He is trying to live it right. He is trying to talk it right. He is trying to do this right. He is striving after my heart and I have something good and great for him. He wants us men to be blameless. That when we walk out in the community or when we're walking out with our friends or when we're at work or when we're at church, that our lives, someone can examine our lives and say, I want what he has. And somewhere along the way, your kids will say, I want what daddy has. There's something different about daddy. My coaches act this way. My teachers act that way. But when I'm around dad, he is solid with the Lord. And so I know that he's solid with me. He wants us to be blameless. He goes on to say that he is upright. In other words, he lives a life that is a straight track for someone else to follow. When someone examines your life, can you say, go ahead and follow my trail 
that I'm leading down the road here because I'm living it upright and living it right. Because that's exactly where the Lord wants us to be. You could look at Job's life, and the trail that he was leading was a trail of godliness that any of his kids or anyone in the community could follow. Are you there? Because that's where he wants us to be. And then he goes on to say he was a man that feared God. Now listen, God is not some old little fella sitting up at the top and got his little stinger. Oh, you did something wrong. Oh, you want to act up? That's not what he does. That's not who he is. When he tells us that we are to fear him, he wants us to have a reverence towards him. He wants us, when we come into his presence, that we bow our heads and our heart and we say, we are undone, we are unclean, we don't deserve to have your grace and mercy, but yet you give it anyways. You are the holy God, and there is a respect there. There is a fear of doing something wrong and killing your relationship with him, rather than just, oh, no, no, don't do this, God. There's a reverence there. It is a wholesome dread of displeasing God. That's what it is. It is a wholesome dread of displeasing God. I don't know how many we do this, God, guys. I don't know how many of us do this. But when we're out and about, do we ever say to ourselves, does this please God? And I'm talking to the women also. Does this please God? I don't know if you remember, but, but back in, 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 in Genesis, when Joseph found himself alone, with Potiphar's wife? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You can tell that Joseph had been raised right. You can tell that Joseph had had time with the father. You can tell that he was solid in his walk. Because when she came to offer herself unto him, this is what he said. Oh, no. How could I do such a thing and sin against God? He was a righteous man. He was an upright man. He was a holy man. He was a man that feared God, just like Job right here. And he knew what he believed, and he was not going to compromise that. Part of our problem is we don't know what we believe sometimes. We don't spend enough time reading God's word and letting God tell us who we are in him in order to battle the things out here that are going to tempt us and trip us up. We have time for everything else. But when it comes to reading this word and having this word empower us and change us and challenge us and convict us and convince us, we don't have very much time for it. We have a big, busy schedule. Our schedule sometimes is more important than the Lord, right? But it is that time that we spend meditating, memorizing, letting God's word saturate inside of us and controlling us and dictating the things that we do and the things that we say and how we treat one another. It changes you. There was something different about Job when he entered into the room. I'm sure people just, there goes Job. Because he lived an upright, holy life. In Proverbs chapter 3, verse 7, 8, it says this, Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. If there is a healthy fear of God and we shun evil, we just say we're not going to engage in risky behavior. I'm going to do things that honor God. It will bring nourishment to your body deep down in your soul and make you all of what God wants you to be. And we miss it sometimes because we're too busy with our stuff. Secondly, Man, he wants us to be present. He wants us to be present. If you look at Job chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, he says this. He had seven sons, three daughters, and he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 of donkeys. He had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the people of the east. His sons used to hold feasts in their homes, on their birthdays, and they would invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. He was present. He was a family man. He was a lover of his wife, and I have to believe that right here, and it doesn't say that anywhere here, but it doesn't say that he's not. It doesn't talk about her until later on in chapter 2 when she decides to say, curse God and die. And then unfortunately, women, we don't hear from her anymore. 
That's another story, though. Don't, women, be encouraged. Your day was last week. Okay, so he finds himself in a predicament here where he says, I am going to live my life for the Lord, and I am going to be a good husband, I am going to be a good father, and I'm going to be a good provider. And that's what he did. He held his family together, for in his house, he said that he was going to honor God. He was going to live righteously before his family so that they would take in what he had to offer. It is so important that we realize what God has called us to be as a man, as a godly man. I write out five cornerstones of a man, things that God has given me and instilled inside of me, and it's a lot like what Job is doing right here, and I just want to share them with you. One of the things about Job that I, Job, that I believe is, is that a man who is godly has to be a leader. He has to be a leader of his flock. And God gives you a flock. Those little people and that beautiful wife that you have right there, those of you who are married and have kids, that's your flock. That's your congregation right there. One of your biggest faults and one of my biggest faults as a minister is that I always thought my flock was outside of the home. Oh, I got to go out there and preach. I got to go out there and talk. I got to go out there and say folks. I gotta, and I got so wrapped up into all of that. And we do get wrapped up in ministry stuff. And we think that we're the only ones that can do it. Well, while I'm being wrapped up in ministry stuff, Satan is working his way inside of my family. Where I'm supposed to be praying over them and loving them and encouraging them. Satan's working his way through and through and in, in and out, in and out in my family. And that's not what God has called. Your first ministry... Men, it's not the golf course. It's not the football game in the Razorbacks, all right? Your first ministry is that that little flock that you have right at your home that looks at you every day for direction. You are to lead them. He says that you are the head, not the tail. And there's oftentimes that we seem like we're the tail and we have our wives doing everything because we don't want to take ownership. We don't want to be present. Yeah, physically we're there, Oh, I'm here, I'm here, here. But we are contributing absolutely nothing to empower our family to prosper and to be all of what God has called them to be. Our job is to be leaders. The second thing I write in there, and that's a cornerstone of a man, is that he needs to be a provider. He needs to be a provider. If you look here, Job talks about he had all of this cattle, all of this stuff. Well, he just didn't get that one day. Someone just didn't bring that to him. He worked his tail off to get there. So he was a wealthy man, but he had put his hands to work. It is our job to tell our kids how to work. A lot of them don't want to work. They won't do anything. Just want to sit around, watch TV, hang out with their friends. You got some money, Daddy? Do you have two good feet? You got some hands? Get your butt out there and work. If we are not teaching our kids how to work and how to provide for themselves, we are making a mistake because God tells us we have work. Yeah. As there's po poverty on the way, if you don't work, yeah. not only does he say we are to provide for our family financially, but I think also he is letting us know that we have to provide the right atmosphere for our kids and our wives to excel. Right. I think at times our atmosphere can be so chaotic at home. You're going here, you're going there, you're arguing over here, we're not doing that, we're doing And it's so chaotic that nobody knows what they're doing. There's no peace in the house, there's no joy in the house, there's no excitement in the house. All it is is we got to go, duh, 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 duh. and everybody, duh. and that's madness. God is a God of order. He is. And there has to be order in your house. And that's you, Mr. Man. And you, Mrs. Wife, working together and figuring out a schedule or a calendar or whatever it takes so that it's not so chaotic in there to where Satan is working his things also and where you're forgetting who you are in Christ. It is a waste of time that we are so great out here in the community and doing wonderful things and our kids are excelling in athletics and everything's going great and we're smiling out here, but when we get home, everybody's miserable. We know how to walk into this church, right, and everybody walks in. And you just cuss each other out in the parking lot. <laughs> I hope I can say that. Is that okay to say it? It's too late. It already went out. <laughs> but we come in here, woo, yeah, praise the Lord. And we just yelled at our spouse. We almost strangled one of our kids. But oh, everything's great. Yes, it's wonderful. <laughs> 
we're just living a lie when we don't have to. Job was not going to live a lie. He was a man who provided for his family. He provided an atmosphere so they could excel, so that they could do great things. He provided an atmosphere that says you work. You learn how to work. You do something with your hands. You do something productive. He had a wife. He took care of his wife. He was a man who loved the Lord, and he realized that he had a job ahead of him, and that was taking care of those kids. Next thing, you have to be a protector. We have to be a protector, man. And that means protecting your kids and your wife from evil that's out here. People get mad at us because I hate phones, okay? Now, Faith is always my example when we come here. She hates when she comes to church with me because when is he going to stop using me for an example? Never until you leave off the college, all right? But the deal is our job that he has given us is to protect our family, and that means protecting them from anything and everything. And one of the things that we decided that we were going to do is we were going to protect faith by at times removing that little phone out of her hand. Uh Uh-oh. Oh, I know some of y'all already gave y'all five years old phone. I know. I know you have. That little six-year-old needs to call you when something's going wrong in his life. I see no purpose. I don't enjoy phones. I don't like phones. And if Pastor Harry didn't have to get in touch with me, I wouldn't have a phone. I wouldn't. But those little devices, that little social stuff that you allow, that many of us allow for our kids to be on, and all kinds of stuff is shooting through there. All kinds of filth, all kinds of negative stuff, all kinds of garbage, ungodly things. And oftentimes we give them this phone so that they'd go over there and not bother us. Our job is to protect the ones that we love. And if that means that our daughter doesn't get a phone because we don't trust what's coming through that phone, then we do what we have to do to protect. If it means that she doesn't go get to go to certain places, then we do our job to protect her. That's what we do. If we don't want her to be corrupted by the things of this world because he says bad company corrupts good manners, then we will do that because it is our job to protect our kids. Dads, it is your job. You have been commissioned by the Lord to do your job in taking care and protecting your kids, your family, your loved ones. And we are neglecting that daily because we don't have the time. I got stuff to do. I got places to be. You start thinking about those hours in the day. Seven or eight of those hours are at school, right? For your kids, you're at work, and then you come home, or they have activities in sports. There's two hours, two and a half hours there. They get home, you got time to eat. You have maybe one little conversation, and then maybe there's 15 minutes with God. Now, who's ruling your house? See, I have to ask myself that, too because I don't get all scot-free on this one. Our job is to provide an atmosphere where our kids can excel, where my wife can excel, and where they feel protected, and where they're growing and maturing into what God wants them to be. As godly men, that's one of our roles, and that's exactly what Job was doing. Fourthly, responsibility. He's given us as men responsibility. Responsibility of taking care of our family's needs, no matter what those needs are, that we are held to be responsible. And that should be an honor. It should be an honor that we get to reach out and do all of what we need to do so that our family can prosper. Be responsible. And at times, we don't want to be responsible, right? As guys, sometimes we just want to escape, right? Raceback game's on. For me, the Titans are on. I'm not doing nothing. If my kid's jumping off the roof, I'm watching the Titans, all right? Just kidding, Faith. But that's what it seemed like sometimes, that we're so wrapped up in us and our stuff that although we're physically there, we're really not present. Our kids, our wives, our husbands need us all to be present in that house. Not just when it's convenient for us, But when it's hard, when it's chaotic, when it's difficult, that we're all taking responsibility and we're all chipping in. And that's what he did. When he realized and thought that his kids were doing something crazy, he was praying for them. 
He was concerned about them. He knew what his kids were doing, where they were, and what was going on in their life. Not that he was being nosy. And young people, we're not trying to be nosy. We're just trying to be concerned. We want the best for you, and we want God, what God has for you. Thirdly, he was a pillar of the community. In Job chapter 1, verse 3b there, it says this about Job. He was the greatest man among all the people in the East. He had a reputation. He had a reputation about who he was, what he did, and how he lived his life. There were people coming from all over to hear his wisdom, to talk to him, to get guidance from him. And you know this to be true because his three friends that showed up with him, when he went into all this trouble that he was dealing with, they showed up for him, which meant that he had invested into their life. He was a pillar in the community. He lived his life in such a way that when people heard him coming, they would stop and recognize, there goes Job. That's the man. That's the man living right. That's the man doing it right. And that his life was an example for anyone to follow. He was a pillar of the community. He was friends. He was faithful. When I think about this right here, about him being a pillar of the community, about Job at this point, I think about my dad. My own dad. My dad passed away three years ago. He's about two months away from celebrating their 70th year, him and mama, their anniversary. And he left us with a heart attack. But daddy was ready to go. Daddy knew the Lord. He knew that God was calling him home. And he went to be with the Savior and to be with some of his kids that are up there with him. But the thing about my dad and the things that I wanted to try to carry with me is that my dad was very present. He was very visible in our life. He was a pillar in the community. People loved my dad. My dad would go out and talk to anybody. He never met a stranger. He's, and, and I kind of picked that up. And I know that it drives our kids crazy because I'll stop and I'll talk for an hour to somebody. When are we leaving? It's time to go. But my dad would do that. He would take out time to talk to anybody. There would be times where, you know, when you have 16 kids, there's fighting time when it comes to eat. When mama would say, hey, it's time to eat. You want to know how I got fast? How I was able to play football? You sprinted to the table with all your might to get your spot at the table. That was just part of it. That's what we did as kids. It made us faster for sports, but that's a whole other story. But my dad, he would attend everything that we were involved in. If it was a PTO, if it was Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, if it was a basketball game, if it was a play at school that we were in, somehow that man wouldn't make it because he wanted to be present and he wanted to be there in the community. And anytime somebody needed something, my dad would give his left arm to make it happen. Daddy would give away our food to some stranger that needed to eat. I'm like, Daddy, what you doing, man? We're hungry. Today. No, no, come on in. You can, you can sit down at the table. That's who he was. When my dad died... When he passed away, our town's made of, of maybe 1,400 people. Over 500 people attended his funeral. Daddy died with no money in his pocket, but he had shared so much love and shown so much grace towards people that people were coming from all over to come say goodbye to him because he was a pillar in the community. Daddy lived a righteous life. He didn't run off on his wife. He didn't run off on his kids. He didn't cheat. He was present. And he was there. And it made me, like I told you earlier, at 18, I wanted to be a dad because I wanted to be what my dad was. And he was a lover of people. He was a lover of God. And he was definitely a lover of his kids and his wife. And that's what I wanted inside of me. And I wanted to exhibit that in my life. And I know sometimes I would call home and I would, I would talk to him and mama and I'd say, what do you do with these kids? <laughs> and, 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 and mama just, you know, she kind of dry. She, she kind of, she fiery. She just say, boy, you only got a few of them. I had 16. Come on, deal with it. <laughs> I mean, that's what you would do. Come on, wake up, boy. Do your job. And that's how it kind of was. But I love what my dad instilled in us. I love seeing that so many people respected him. 
And so many people came out to say goodbye to him because he was a pillar in the community. Our job is to be pillars in the community. Our job is to be visible so that your light shines through and they gravitate towards you and they want to know what is it about you because I want it. Because you're living upright, holy, fearful lives of the Lord and there's something different about you. Not because of you, but because who dwells inside of you. Lastly, says this, and it's number five on being a cornerstone of man, a godly man. He is a pursuer of God. In Job 1, 5 and 8, it says this in closing. When a period of feasting had run its course, Job would make arrangements for them to be purified. Early in the morning, he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, thinking, perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular custom. One day, the angels came to present them, themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, from roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. God said, this is my man. He's living right. He's holy. He's pure. He's righteous. It doesn't mean that he's without sin, but he's living the right way. Put yourself up against him, Satan, and you can do anything you want to but take his life. I trust this man because this man trusts me. He spends time sacrificing to the Lord when he feels like his kids have been engaging in sinful acts. He has a prayer life with me. He has a relationship with me. I will put him up against anyone. And men, that's what God is looking for out of us. He is looking for some men who will stand up and say, choose me, Satan. I'll go against you because my father up above will give me the strength and the power to come against you. And we will prevail because he already tells us we have the victory in him. It's time. It is time. Men, it is time to take your proper place. It is time for you to step up and say, I'm here and I'm ready to battle. Let's go. Every time before a football game, the coach would come in and give this rah-rah speech. And, and before you know it, woo, let's go. It's the same rah-rah that Jesus gives us in his word. That you are to be the godly man for your family. That you are to make the stand for your family. That you are to pray for your family. That you are to be the head of your family. And let nothing get in the way of that. Let nothing slow you down from being the godly man that I've called you to be. He has entrusted that wife and those kids and you who are not married, your future. To get a hold of being a man that honors God and loves him. And watch what God would do in your life and in your family's life. Don't miss out on that. Don't miss out on that. Where are you today? Where are you today, men? Are you ready for battle? Because I'm telling you, it's coming a time to where you about to be ready to fight. And you about to be equipped with this word. Not that you have to know it memorize it, but it needs to be deep down in your heart so that you'll have something to stand on because we're heading into a battle and if you don't have your weapon with you, we're going to lose. We need you, men. We need you. Feel the call. Feel the weight of that. And don't run from it. Run towards it. It says when David finally went out because everybody was sitting around and nobody wanted to fight the giant and the giant was making fun of folks. It says that David ran to the battle. He ran to the giant. He ran to the circumstances. He didn't back down. He didn't hush up. He said, come on. It's not you against me, big boy. It's you against me and my God. All right? It's you against me and my God. You have God on your side, men. Don't back down. Don't hush up. Stand up. And be firm and I'm ready for battle, Lord. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, this call is not easy. It's not always fun to be a dad. When we have our kids rebelling, 
when we have our wife saying, you're not doing enough, when we have our bosses yelling at us at work and then we have to come home and hear it there too. Father, but you never promised that it would be easy. But you did promise you'd be there. You did promise you would not forsake us and leave us. You did promise us that your arms, you tell us, are not too short, that it can't catch us. Father, I pray that the men here would not feel condemnation today, but they would feel your grace and that they would understand that with you they can conquer anything. All things are possible with you. And Father, help them to hear and help us to understand that as long as we're still breathing, we got a chance to start over. And I know some of them think it's too late. People say this about me and people say that about me, but what you say about them, Lord, is all that matters. Father, I pray that we would take on that obligation of being a dad and being a godly one so that our kids, so that our daughters one day would want to marry godly men and that our young men would want to seek godly women. Father, you have a job for us to do, and I pray that we would do it with love and understanding and grace, but Father, I pray that we would not fear what you've set in front of us but that we would go towards it with your strength and your power, believing that we can do all things through you. Father, I pray for blessings over these men. Wherever they are in their walk with you, wherever they are in their relationship with other people, I just pray for your hand of favor and your love to just fall upon them and give them rest, restore them, renew them, strengthen them to be what you call them to be. Let them not back up and hush. Let them stand up and speak up and be the godly men that you called us to be. We love you. We need you. Father, there might be someone out here who might not know you, might not have your strength yet. And you make it really simple. If we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in thy heart that God raised him from the dead, then thou shalt be saved. If you don't know the Lord, he wants to know you. He has a free gift for you. And all you simply have to say is, Lord, please come live in my heart. Forgive me of my sins and take control of my life from this point forward. I pray for that for anyone that's there, Lord. Father, we need you. We love you, and we praise you this morning. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.